All right, hello. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're so excited to have you here. I am Shasta Grant, and I co-founded Brown Bag Lit with Chloe Elena Miller. Um, first, I'd like to welcome our two interns and invite them to introduce themselves to you. Dimitra, can you say hello? Yes, hello. I'm Dimitra Matutis. I'm the PR intern at Brown Bag Lit, where I work on publicity and graphics. I'm a PR major with a minor in creative writing at American University, and I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you. Sarah, say hello. Hi, I'm the communications intern at Brown Bag. Um, I'm currently a senior at AU with double major in journalism and creative writing, um, and I primarily work on graphics and interviews for Brown Bag. I'm really happy to be here as well. Thank you. Welcome. Um, okay. So we've got just a little quick um, overview of Brown Bag Lit, and then we will um, go on to our panel. Okay, so um, Brown Bag Lit started with a phone call when Chloe called me in December of 2022 and said, I've got an idea. And my immediate response was, I'm in. But really, it started years ago when a poet, Chloe, and a fiction writer, me, met at Sarah Lawrence College, Sarah Lawrence's College's MFA program in 2003. We shared work, we took the train into the city to attend readings, and we maintained a friendship throughout decades and continents. We've presented at conferences together, we shared a hotel room at the Not Fake AWP conference, and we even put together a DIY writing residency one summer so we could spend time writing together. And it's in this spirit of community that we conceived of Brown Bag Lit, where everyone like you is welcome. We host most of our events at lunchtime, East Coast time, because as busy working parents, we find this schedule fits best for us and we hope it does for you as well. In our first year, we've offered classes, a virtual summer residency, an accountability group. Um, we've had almost 20 free events, and now this is our second annual fake AWP conference. Our upcoming offerings include a class on writing turns in poetry and prose with Chloe, our lunch break writing accountability group, which is ongoing and you can join anytime. And we'll be returning to our regular programming of monthly um, events and those events are free and you can register for our events and our classes and accountability group on our website brownbaglet.com. For this year's fake AWP series we're very happy to be partnering with the Portland Oregon based bookstore Annie Bloom's Books. Annie Bloom's has been a proud indie since 1978 and can ship anywhere in, in the United States from their store. You can follow the link in the chat to order books to support these fabulous writers and the bookstore. So now on to the show. Please join me in welcoming our authors, Amy Barnes, April Bradley, Elaine Chu, and Jolene McElwain. And I'm going to turn it over to April. Hi hey everyone, thank you so much for attending. It's, it's fabulous to see so many familiar faces. Um, this is a panel that we um, created and submitted to AWP for Seattle. And we did it for a virtual presentation since we were all scattered all over the world and we were denied. And actually since it's conference in 2008, AWP has only selected six total panels that have anything to do with food. So we knew that we were going up against something um, challenging. And we're so grateful for Brown Bag um, for uh, sponsoring us here. Okay, so how do we capture the emotional power of food experience in our writing? Crafting narratives with food memories opens up rich fields of exploration and connections, rendering complex, vibrant narratives that resonate with emotion. Focusing on food memories and experiences, we each draw upon multi-genre work from fiction to creative nonfiction to hybrid narratives to discuss craft techniques, textual strategies, and revision strategies relevant to food memories and writing craft that often go overlooked in writing workshops and textbooks. Now, writing about food, food memories, and food experiences develops and strengthens fiction, creative nonfiction, and inspires experimentation and prose. So we'll be exploring diverse aspects of food writing craft within the context of setting and character, 
of ending and interrogating stereotypes, its vital role in rendering personal stories, culture, and history, and how we use food in our work to explore and interrogate relationships and social issues. I don't recall how our panel came together, and my best guess is that Amy Barnes and I were talking about it and said, yeah, let's do this. Because um, whenever Amy and I talk, it's about food and writing. So, and and it was it was Amy who had texted me to say, hey, um, you know, Shasta and Chloe are doing fake AWP again. Let's submit our proposal. Um, and so our first person is Elaine. Thank you so much, April, for having me. It's actually a real honor for me. And I completely relate to this thing about like when you get together, you talk about food. You know, why not? Um, it's, um, I think this is the thing that I say um, at all my food uh, workshops and panels that food is a great story enabler. Why? First, because nothing evokes uh, all five of our senses at once as much as food. I didn't say this, actually. I didn't come up with this. Amanda Hesser, who was food critic at the New York Times at one point, she said this. Um, food tells us a lot about ourselves, our relationships, our society, and our culture. Um, in fact, it was literary critic Terry Eagleton who says that although food looks like an object, it is actually a relationship. Um, can we pull up my um, slides? This is just so that I don't get blown off course because I tend to ramble. And also since I'm going first, I'm a little bit nervous. So, you know, I end up talking too much. Um, let me just begin by saying that food, as you all probably agree, is like the great metaphor in literature. Uh, but today, instead of quoting the great um, Jean Antombria Savaran, I'm probably re mispronouncing the French name terribly. Please forgive me. Uh, he famously said, and I know you all know this, tell me what you eat and I will tell you what you are. Let me, in honor of the Lunar New Year, quote Confucius. Knowing how to eat properly has always been a metaphor for how to live properly. So food for me is uh, often a stand-in, uh, a proxy, uh, a, a marker of culture. It's rich fodder for me for comedic and satirical grazing. Um, so for example, chopsticks. Um, it's seen as synonymous with Chinese culture, even though the Koreans, the Japanese, the Thais, the Vietnamese, and basically Asian, many Asian diasporas across the globe use them too. Same with the fortune cookie, even though technically it's not even Chinese. It's um, it's uh, it's invented in America. These food markers can be reductive, but for me, subverting them is fresh, it's refreshing, and it opens up different pathways to intersecting many social and cultural ley lines. For example, you see the cover um, of the Heartsick Diaspora, uh, that's my short story collection, and it's got this incongruous uh, image of, you know, a pair of chopsticks holding up a piece of toast. Um, and it's really my play on uh, using food and humor together. Actually, uh, a member of the audience once said to me, you laugh, but that's exactly what my Chinese mother does. Um, so humor and food, I think it's a very rich area to explore. Um, it's a great pathway. Um, so in my novel, The Light Between Us, the cover is on there as well, um, two characters are having uh, this very, very spicy Sichuan steamboat. Um, can we show my next slide so you can see an image of what that looks like? Yeah, so that's the image, uh, the first image on the left. It's called Mala Huokuo. It's a very spicy Sichuan steamboat swimming in this scrim of like chili oil. And um, it's got so thousands of like dried chili peppers in it. So it's basically a mini cauldron of hell. And I have um, my two characters having a conversation while they're having this very spicy Sichuan steamboat. They're having a conversation about Chinese spirit possession uh, and very aptly the guardians of Chinese hell. 
Uh, can we flip back to my first slide? Uh, so I also use food to show hybrid culture or culture mixing in complex issues of belonging, diaspora, and migration. Um, there's a great quote from food scholar, uh, Singaporean food scholar Tan Chi Beng in Food and Foodways in Southeast Asia, where he says, uh, migrants reinscribe their culinary culture. They reproduce um, what they've known, the familiar food and taste in the new places that they've migrated to. They may be limited by the lack of certain ingredients, which influences then the making of familiar foods. But at the same time, they have access to new ingredients and new culinary knowledge of the local people where they've now settled, as well as historical and global influences in that part of the world. Thus, migrants and their descendants not only reproduce traditional foods, they also reinvent these foods. And in fact, they invent completely new dishes. And I think that that's just actually really exciting. Um, so for example, in the Heartsick Diaspora, I have a story about American born Chinese kids growing up in New York, celebrating Thanksgiving as you do with a turkey 10 pounder. But in this case, it's stuffed with egg, uh, pork egg foo yum. To use uh, Benedict Anderson's uh, cultural anthropological term, this is called imagined tradition. We carry our traditions with us like turtles across migratory routes. The imagined tradition then becomes a site for the confluence of multiple cultural currents. Uh, more often than not, I deploy food as a way to showcase rifts, disjunctures, and pressure points in social issues. Um, in another story in the collection titled Run of the Molars, three Singaporean sisters in London try to replicate that very spicy steamboat that you see, but they do it Singaporean style in London um, to welcome their mother, to give her a sense of home uh, when their mother visits them for the first time in London. But for the mother, it's missing key ingredients like jujubes, which is a kind of Chinese red, red dates, and dong kwai, it's a kind of uh, Chinese roots, um, really, really good with lots of phytoestrogens. Because it's missing these key ingredients, she absolutely refuses to eat it. She asks instead for two slices of white bread. And her rejection brings up this invisible specter uh, of cultural authenticity with food preparation as a litmus test. Food um, is, of course, a classic way to show um, class issues. Um, and in another story in the collection, Rap of the Tiger Mother, um, I intersect class and race where a young mother and her son uh, Chinese mother are invited to very posh English tea and play date at um, an upper crest South Kensington home. Um, and then uh, in face my story that won the Bridport Prize, I again use food etiquette to show intergenerational cultural pressure points between first and second generation Chinese diaspora. So the grandmother, first generation Chinese, um, is has immigrated to London, um, and but she wants to return home, except that she can't because of her health issues. As a way of bonding with her granddaughter, she offers this Chinese candy, it's called Hall Flakes, it's made from a Chinese bush, that's called Chinese Hawthorn. Um, and it's a way of her showing her affection for her uh, granddaughter. But her daughter-in-law, Karen, who's second generation uh, Chinese, um, born in San Francisco, is horrified because she thinks whole flakes with all its, you know, uh, processed sugar content is sure to rot her daughter's teeth. The grandmother, likewise, can't relate to the way that the family has dinner, she says. I'm going to read a little bit from, from the book now. Um, the other evening at dinner, Karen said, pass the broccoli. At her look of incomprehension, Karen explained, it's what you do when the dishes are too far to reach. This is Chinese eating culture in the West. Instead of proper placement, main dishes move around the table like mobile units. In her growing up days, family dinners were boisterous affairs. Grandparents, parents, children, cousins, everyone helping themselves. And the noise was a wacky cacophony of clicking chopsticks and conversation fragments layered on top of each other. If you were unable to reach a dish, someone would notice and surely slip a slice of meat or a morsel of veg into your bowl of rice. By contrast, Karen's dinner table clatters with spoons, 
spoons everywhere, a serving spoon for every main dish. Oh, so many spoons. So as you can see, I love using drama at the dinner table as a site of confluence and contestation. My uh, brother has actually been revisiting a lot of 1980s and 1990s Hong Kong sitcoms recently, and he says there's at least five dining tables per ep uh, table seats per episode. It seems all they do is sit around a dinner table and bicker. And I'm often taken aback too by how much Singaporeans and Malaysians polemicize food. And so in that Thanksgiving story that I was referring to earlier, the middle-aged Chinese mother uh, talks about her sexual appetites that have gone unsatiated following the death of a close friend uh, to the chagrin of all at the dinner table, the son, the daughter, the Japanese exchange student, uh, while the father very quickly and deftly escapes into the garden shed. So food, sex, and death for me are inex inextricably interlinked. Food um, is, a high, is a highway into the psyche of a diasporic person. I often use food to examine psychic planes of feeling and mindsets, it attending issues of migration, diaspora, and um, displacement. Feelings of, you know, like feelings about belonging, feelings of longing and yearning for a homeland. And mind you, this is not an actual homeland uh, because as Kazuo Ishiguro was, um, uh, had called it, it's actually a place in time. It's, it's like a childhood place that exists only in your mind and it's a place basically which you can never ever return to effectively so this mind frame obviously is attended by feelings of nostalgia and there's nothing like food from one's homeland to evoke this most poignantly I mean I think we can all probably relate to this you know you have a craving for a certain food but not just for that certain food but the way that your mother or your grandmother had prepared it, you know? So in the title story, The Heartsick Diaspora, I have the main character there longing for um, these sesame balls with a red be bean filling. Can we show that slide so you can see that second picture in that slide? Um, that's what it looks like, the se these sesame balls, yeah. So, and she remembers having them with her grandmother in a food court in Singapore. And that's like, you know, very much a part of her childhood. So. Of course, you know, I think memory is such a great uh, enabler of story, um, food memories especially, but they don't have to always be nostalgic. They can be bitter or sorrowful as well. And that's also um, a great story um, pathway or enabler, which leads up to my next, next point, food acting as a substitute for affection. Uh, food scholar Paula Torero Pazzo actually coined this phrase, edible metaphors. I think it's such a great uh, phrase because, and she says, we don't eat just because we are hungry. We also eat because we are anxious or somehow emotionally starved. Or in my case, I sometimes actually don't eat at all. Um, Chinese culture, notoriously Malaysian and Singaporean cultures are replete with examples of parents using food, saying, eat, eat eat to show affection instead of saying we love you kiddo or giving hugs hugs what are those we don't do that have you eaten is also um, a question often used as greetings with friends and family instead of how are you it acts as community social glue we don't expect an answer by the way we don't start telling me about your you know Hainanese chicken rice and how it wasn't value for money because you got you know uh, breast meat instead of thigh meat too much information. Um, in the last uh, story in my collection, Mapping Three Lives Through a Red Rooster Chamber Pot, I use food through a historical lens to examine ancestry and heritage and layering in cultural anthropology, history, and sociology. I show like how food is used in cultural traditions and Taoist mythology. Uh, if we can flip back to my second slide, I want to show you the food that served um, to the kitchen god during Lunar New Year, which is, in fact, today is the second day of the Lunar New Year. So it's called a nian gao. It's a glutinous rice cake. Um, and that served to the kitchen god in order to seal his lips so he won't go reporting all the bad deeds of the household to the emperor of heaven. A little bit like um, uh, the Christmas song, Santa, is, Santa Claus is coming to town. Are you naughty or nice? 
Um, so I also use food as a way to break open long held family secrets because when we eat, our mouths are open. And in a moment of narrative tension, you never know what comes out. Using food um, as a pathway to interrogate gaps in history, if we can go back to my first slide, is something that I probably want to continue to explore going forward. It's my last point as well. Um, so in the first story in the collection, The Coffin Maker, I showcase the inventive making of food using food scraps and wastes during the Japanese occupation uh, of Malaya in World War II. And of course, as we all know, food during war time is often used as a method of communication as well. Coded messages uh, or spies use it as a network for coded messages, and they're often hidden within sacks of rice and sacks of, you know, different different sacks of food. Um, I'm going to wrap up here. Probably my a lot of time is, uh, is up, um, but I just hope that I hope that this sort of like allows you to see that uh, food is just you know, and these are some of the story pathways that you can go down. Um, it's just basically a very, very rich uh, literary metaphor. Uh, okay, that's me. <laughs> Hi, Amy Barnes is up next. Amy? I'm wondering, did we lose Amy or is Amy here? Amy was at the airport. Yeah, she's um I, I was just having a hard time okay. unmuting. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think uh, I didn't realize it, but coming um coming to Kansas City and doing this panel is kind of an interesting full circle because I grew up in Kansas. So the first thing that I did when I got here was seek out that food that I haven't had for 30 years. And so everybody's in panels and I'm out roaming around looking for specific, there's a specific Czechoslovakian food that I ate when I was here and a certain kind of barbecue. And so there's something very full circle with finding that food that was a different kind of memory. Um, and it actually, I got, I went, like 20 minutes away and they brought out one of these foods and it was that initial sensory. I think the sensory part of food is what is really important to me. And it smelled like the eighties in my childhood. And that was such an odd thing because it's a very hyper regional food that only exists in a very specific part of the Midwest. And there was something about that because I'm not first or second generation immigrant, but my family has only been here maybe a hundred years. And so some of these are the foods that are here in Kansas only that I had that ties me back to them. So coming to this AWP is kind of a, I'm sitting here with food in the airport that was things that I went and sought out as part of that. And um, I, I've worked with April on Ruby Lit, but what I don't maybe talk about on the literary side is that I also write like new food reviews from McSweeney's which everything is in quotations. They're very much satirical, but I went back and looked at some of those coming into this panel. And within those, I mentioned the family touch points and the regionalism and why those specific foods and bring those things in. And then I also write, I, I find food writing like in my fiction. So in each one of these collections, there's food mentions that tie things together. But I also write very nonfiction food writing for places like Southern Living and All Recipes. So I'm actually developing recipes and they're looking more for the, like the audience has changed. They've always been kind of nostalgic, but I'm also getting to write things that are like, my grandmother made this, this is why I make it. Or so even in those commercial publications, they're looking for that because people want the recipes, but the ones that do the best for them is that food writing where it's like my grandmother made this it ties to my 100 years ago that is something we've always made and so i think there's that touch point that people get even in that very non-fiction side of things but i think in flash i think food 
we were talking about it at AWP that um, the food that we insert into Flash, Flash, I think, if you're writing a thousand words, I've looked at it and sometimes my characters, there's no description of their clothes. They might as well be naked. Uh, they don't have names sometimes. Sometimes I don't even specify gender, which I don't realize I'm doing that. But there'll be a touch point of food. And I actually went in and like did a search for certain things. So I would find the first food mention and then I would go through and search through that. And so there's one of the books actually has a watermelon on the cover, which I didn't know I actually had food directly on there as well. But there was there's some story of when my um the relatives came over through Ellis Island, they had like cans of peas. And I went back and looked in that specific brand and I didn't realize it, but I had written in the second collection, I had written those cans of peas in and it's like in there six times, but it's in totally different stories. And it's kind of a progression of here are these peas that, that they were green, but in that 700 word space, I could put that can of peas and that was enough that it kind of grounded that story. And in the last one, there are pickles in multiple places and I jam a character into a pickle jar, which is the surreal reality, the surreal side of things, which I think is something really interesting with food that you can blow it up into something that maybe is more of that surreal side. I think it is a nice, we, we can play with our food. So I think, especially in Flash, it's really interesting to be able to say, okay, that smell of pickles or sourdough bread. And it, it's the one thing I think you can evoke that memory and it might be different for everyone. Like the bread that my mother made is gonna be different, but I think it, it's something that if, can evoke those sensory details without you having to do an entire paragraph. So I think that with my writing, I didn't, I didn't realize that. And so it was kind of enlightening. I mean, I know I write about food and I write for Ruby and even that story that um, April originally published before she let me help her out was not a normal food story. It, it definitely is something that, but it explores like chronic illness in a way that deals with food. And so it's kind of a way I think if you're writing that and you put the food in there because everyone has to eat something, I think it's a way to maybe soften hard events and there's a lot of that, I think, within childhood, but it was really interesting coming here and sitting there um, eating that. And I think coming out of AWP, I have all these pictures of food. And I think I posted earlier today, I took pictures of people, but I haven't sifted through that. The food was what it was. And so as I'm walking through, I have all of these food pictures of AWP, which is kind of how I approached it without even thinking about today. Um, and then I'm going to go back. And I think there's something about that, that we get homesick for things. But I think when I think about places, there's still foods that it was too far away. I couldn't get to those places. But I think that's what tugs the hardest. And I think in Elaine's talk earlier, you could hear some of that. That is those, the, there's certain things that are missing that makes it not quite right. Because they have these foods in Nashville, but it's not going to be the same. And it was interesting on all of these menus, there was Nashville hot chicken, which we don't eat in Nashville. I mean, it exists and it's all over the place, but it was interesting that they brought that here. Um, so I think it was just a, I think despite the fact that I'm in the airport and this is very odd and I maybe didn't plan quite well enough. I, I think there's something very full circle about that, that those memory touch points, the title of this is so applicable because I think it's really a way to evoke the very specific memories that I have, but then it also is, if I say the word peas, everyone is going to have a different opinion of that. And some people will love them. It's kind of like it's the, um, the herb that smells like soap to some people. And I think there's something really important, especially in flash when you might have very, very minimal words that that is a way to evoke those sensory details, which I think is what brings that back down and makes you have that touch point. So I think you can, I'll keep things moving. So you can move on, maybe we can have more questions. So I think I'm good. All right, April. Amy, thank you so much. I took a note <laughs> thank with you, you and Elaine. <laughs> I'm back around. 
Um, and, oh, y'all, I can't see the chat, so I have no idea. No, I can't either. <laughs> I just wanted to put Amy's book up because it's wonderful. If you haven't ordered it, I absolutely love it. This is my endorsement for it. And, and, and hers is too. I have hers as well, just not here. <laughs> right. I put these little QR codes on people's um, slides. So if you want to find out how to buy their books, please do. They're all amazing. Next up is Jolene. Oh, hey, April, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Chloe and Shasta for making it happen. I'm just honored to be here with April and Amy and Elaine. Um, so I'm going to talk about Appalachia because that's where my book Cytal Creep is based. And I want to talk a little bit about the history of upending and perpetuating stereotypes through food, considering food choices that elevate, stigmatize and complicate our work and the strategic use of food imagery to render mood and tone and to layer themes. I sort of cut my teeth on um, poets because I tried to be a poet and then I was a very failed poet, but I loved William Carlos Williams's uh, This Is Just To Say, and I'm gonna read it to you because this is something that I taught almost every year to my students to try to get them into the idea of poetry. This is just to say, I have eaten the plums that were in the ice box and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me. They were delicious, so sweet, and so cold. Now, of course, it's a poem about food, but that poem, that tiny little poem, so well written, and he, he was from the Imagist movement, so he's so into, you know, using the very simple objects with grace and respect. But what it did is it opened up conversations about, well, what if it had been an apple? Well, that would have been a better one-to-one -one correlation between the story of the Garden of Eden and his poem. It would be a story about betrayal and forgiveness, which is what this poem's about. And I would ask them sometimes, but what if this poem, what if it was about caviar? They ate the last of the caviar or, or ate the last of the beef jerky or better yet, venison jerky. How would that change this poem? We would have wonderful, wonderful conversations about how just one food choice could alter the meaning of a piece. Um, the Imagist movement is what, those are the writers that I sort of followed. And then I went on to follow another poet, um, Jane Kenyon. And in my epigraph for my book, I use a line from Let Evening Come that says, to the bottled in the ditch, to the scoop in the oats, to the air in the lung, let evening come. I was always highly aware when I was writing about this particular place, which objects that I would use that would create a certain kind of story or a certain kind of place. But I was very, very aware of the stigmas that could go with the types of food where I was from, where I was from. Because sometimes in the past history of, of writing about Appalachia, there have been really negative connotations attached to types of food. You might have heard it yourself. You know, what are you having? Squirrel stew? What are you having? Roadkill? And these are really hurtful to the people that live in, in the area. And they were perpetuated by people that were outsiders writing about the, this area. I also wondered about, you know, when I put in the term halluski or or maybe pierogi, you know, what what would that mean whenever someone read my work? Um, would it make some people feel like they weren't part of my pieces? Would it make some people feel like they were being kept out because they didn't understand what that kind of food was? So you can do both. You can make people feel like they're part of it or not. In her book about the history of Appalachian people and their food, it's called Appalachia on the Table. And I'll put this link in the, in the chat. Um, this is Erica Abrams Locklear, where she writes about the history of food representation in Appalachian literature. If you teach food writing, definitely pick up this copy. Or if you're just interested in food trends, she talks about how um, in one particular chapter called Feeling Poor and Ashamed, Food Stigmas in Appalachia, she writes, food and the social judgments associated with it can act as a kind of cultural shorthand. Certain dishes become marked as belonging to a particular race, ethnicity, class, or region, which then signals the possession or absence of power in varying degrees. And she goes on to cite scholars Peter Nacarado and um, Kathleen Labesco as saying that food can function as economic and cultural commodity, like Elaine was talking about, these differences in class that come up. It's not always expensive food choices that like that make you think of a certain way about people. It they kind of it they call this kind of value associated with particular foods culinary capital. 
noting that these assigned values shift depending on time and context. And using the slippery idea of cultural culinary capital um, to discuss food in Appalachia that reveals this great deal about who the people are, um, the same dishes that local color authors use to denigrate mountain people are sometimes used in the contemporary movement to venerate them. You know, now you can find like greens um, in, in, in certain kinds of greens that people might've found along the road, right? Ramps, people talk about ramps. I had a situation in a writing group um, that were people from not from around my area. And they asked me specifically questions about the choices I made for the foods. Like they said to me, would your characters know the difference between types of mushrooms and would they really ever have eaten truffles? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I know so many mushroom foragers. So the next thing I did is the next story I wrote was about a mushroom forager. And I made sure that I used all of the wonderful language that mushroom foragers that I know talk, they talk in these wonderful, big, wonderful words. I had another situation in a writing group where someone asked me, would someone really know the difference between the wines and would they really know how to reduce wine for a sauce? In other words, seemingly thinking that if you're from Appalachia, you might know nothing about culinary cuisine and, and especially gourmet culinary cuisine. But we have Anthony Bourdain, we have Gordon Ramsay, who have come to the mountains and done shows about this wonderful food. So sometimes it's used to venerate, sometimes it's used to denigrate. Um, so I thought about this a lot when I was writing my stories. And so sometimes what I tried to do is pick something that was a particular kind of stereotype, like squirrel stew. And I wrote a piece called Oiling the Gun that was uh, published originally by Jam, uh, by uh, the Journal of Compressed Creative Arts. And it's a, of course, it, it features, you know, squirrel stew from my childhood. But it's also really about a story about a girl who's dealing with internalized classism and comparing her life to Amy Carter's life, her father to President Carter. I also wrote a story called Jeep that, thank you, April, she published in Ruby Literary. And on its surface, that story is about a family who lives along, along a river road. And what happens in that story is uh, the ice cream man hits into a Jeep, or I'm sorry, the ice cream man in his Jeep hits into a deer. And the, and the people in the community come around, they get the deer out of the windshield and they take it off to slaughter. They end up eating part of the loin of that deer later on in the evening. Now, yeah, the people are eating roadkill. Okay, I got you there with the stereotype. But what I try to do is sort of get you to the table, so to speak, with that kind of stereotype. Then hopefully I'm, I'm able to get you more deeply into the considerations about neighboring about family, about grief, even when an animal is killed in that tragic way. And so in that story, I use both wonderful um, ice cream from the ice cream truck and this idea of eating roadkill. So I think sometimes you can take the stereotype and you can bust it out and make people really look more closely at your writing because you've drawn them in with something that they think they understand. But then hopefully if you give them a deep enough character, they'll they'll start to really question what they thought prior to. Also, I wanted to say that it's interesting to watch TikTok influencers. I watch Lakin's Appalachian Life and now I watch her brother too. That's Trails and Tribulations 12. They, they get on their... TikToks each day and give such amazing recipes and there's such a pride around it. Um, I think that these, again, current food narratives are now celebrating, but it won't surprise me if we turn the corner and again, people are being denigrated by how their choices of food sort of plays out. Another thing that it can do is sort of create micro tension in your stories, or it can, um, help you out with your scenes. There's a story in my book, it's the longest one called Those Red Boots. And it's about a character who runs a restaurant. And this restaurant is known for this unbelievable pulled pork and fresh side and wonderful barbecue. And so the beginning of the story, you know, you, what's your appetite, hopefully, where you hear about this unbelievable food. The girls who, who are waitresses in the place are also equally consumed by their by the people that visit the restaurant. They're very sexy. It's kind of like a, a Hooters. The girls wear these sexy red boots. What happens in the story is one of the girls goes missing. But because I was able to start the story with this really deeply considered um, abundant kind of description about pulled pork and the sweetness of it, 
at one of the pivotal scenes in the book, and I won't give away what happens or who the killer is or who the person is that that, that is involved with um, the girl going missing. I will say that I made a very clear decision that I knew I wanted to take that scene out of the restaurant and put it in a quiet kitchen. And I wanted them to be eating pork, but I wanted it to be a very greasy, plain pork chop with fried potatoes. So you can also do that with your writing where you use food to create a tone and sometimes layer a theme in about how something that's unappetizing, like finding out who the who the perpetrator of a crime is, will be paired with uncomfortable, indigestible food. Um, I also would teach uh, how to build character around the food choices and to sort of upend stereotypes in that way. And I won't be talking now about an Appalachian writer, but I'll talk about my favorite writer, Annie Prue, who writes about, you know, Colorado, Wyoming area. And in her story, The Half Skin Steer, she introduces characters through what they eat or drink. Miro is a character who lived on a ranch in the West and then comes to the East and sort of gets to become a hipster. Now, she doesn't tell you that's what happens to Miro, but Here's what she says in the story. On Saturday morning, with 400 miles in front of him, he swallowed a few bites of scorched eggs, potatoes painted with canned salsa verde, a cup of yellow coffee, left no tip, got on the road. The food was not what he wanted. His breakfast habit was two glasses of mineral water, six cloves of garlic, a pear. And so we see that he is what he eats. He's a wholly different person than what we might think of the stereotype. Um, and another place, he's describing his father. And he says, the old man drank his Everclear, stirred with a peeled willow stick for the bitter taste. And you find out that the father is very bitter. So this is a way that she's just brilliant. I mean, you look at any of her stories and she does this. Um, I also taught Like Water for Chocolate by Laura Esquivel, Harriet Simpson's Arno's The Dollmaker, and Crystal Wilkinson's The Birds of Opulence and Praise Song for the Kitchen Ghost. These are all authors that are doing an unbelievable, amazing job with both perpetuating stereotypes in some ways, but also upending them and interrogating them and kind of forcing the writer or the reader to do the same. Um, I also wanted to say that some of the interesting things that are happening right now, and we're seeing them pop up in people's writing, is they're talking about repurposing food and charity food and kind of busting that stigma or stereotype with that. These farm to table restaurants um, that are showing up in, in writing are doing some interesting things with making us think more deeply about our decisions that we make. I think that the, the if I have one takeaway from this, it's that, Yes, food will come up in your writing. It's inevitable. But don't forget to question yourself with every food choice and understand how you can maybe more strategically use that food to deepen your stories and grow them in ways that you might not have thought of before. Adding in a food, like Amy said, is just an incredible thing. And sometimes it can be shorthand for you, like it's the peas. It makes you feel like, you know, you have a feeling of home. But sometimes it's more than that. I'm going to close with a poem by Jane Kenyon, and this I'm going to dedicate to my friend, deep, deeply loved friend and fellow workshop partner who died suddenly last week, Gail McGloin. Her birthday's today, and I wanted to read this because it reminds me of what I'm feeling about her, but it also reminds me of how Jane Kenyon did such an amazing job of writing about grief and loss and going through the kinds of things you go through when someone passes through a simple image of a cookie. It's called Eating the Cookies. And then I'll end here. And I just want to say thank you so much for everyone for coming. And uh, hopefully we'll have more questions after. Eating the Cookies. The cousin from Maine, knowing about her diverticulus, let out the nuts. So the cookies weren't entirely to my taste. But they were good enough. Yes, good enough. Each time I emptied a drawer or shelf, I permitted myself to eat one. I cleared the closet of silk caftans that slipped easily from clattering hangers. And from the bureau, I took her nightgowns and sweaters, financial documents neatly cinctured in long gray envelopes, and the hairnets and peppermints she tucked among lucite frames, abounding with great-grandchildren, solemn in their Christmas finery. Finally, the drawers were empty, the bags full, and the largest cookie, which I had saved for last, lay solitary in the tin with a nimbus of crumbs around it. 
There would be no more parcels from Portland. I took it up, sniffed it, and before eating it, pressed it against my forehead because it seemed like the next thing to do. Thank you. And I will put in the, I will put the link to um, this book in the chat. Thank you so much, Jolene. Um, you actually reminded me something about um, my, the very first story I wrote. I, I didn't start writing creatively until my forties. Um, before then I did technical writing. Um, I left the PhD program in philosophy. So I like to keep literature sort of hoarded away for myself because I loved it so much. It was how I relaxed with the world. And then I started to write and what I wrote about were um, this pair of sisters who make a trip down a creek and they end up at a barbecue place. And they've traveled so long, so hard, it's been hot and their uncle comes to get them. But this is, you know, a real barbecue place where I grew up. It's the creek that I've walked. And I, you know, I just really, I was going through my memory, like how have I included food in my own writing? I don't really consider myself a food writer or someone who uses a lot of food, but it's definitely there. Um, but what, very quickly, I'm going to show you all these recipe cards. My grandmother, when I was in graduate school, sent me a series of cards. And she wrote these anecdotes, little stories on the back of them, like this chocolate pie is one that my grandfather um, loved. And, you know, here's another one. Um, my friend Alex helped me track down what Puddin' and Stop is, and she found it in an archive in an Elizabethan cookbook. And, but who knows? I don't know how my grandmother got this recipe. She got it from her mother, and they're all from um, Appalachia in the mountains. And it's just, it's, um, it's a sauce. It's a custard, really. And, oh, but doesn't have an egg, does it? No, so it's not technically custard, but it's this really yummy sauce that she would just throw on top of cake for a quick dessert. And we always had dessert. You know, no meal was complete if you didn't have a bread and dessert. Um, and then the last one, this is um, a pie that she used to bake for my grandfather. And I want y'all, you my writing is actually somewhat similar to hers. I'm left-handed and she was left-handed when she was born, but she was told she couldn't come back to school in third grade if she didn't write with her right hand. And so she was, she was always very embarrassed about her writing. And um, like she would, um, later in life, she would ask me to write thank you cards for her because she didn't want to do it. Now, this is a woman who was a wonderful artist, but had absolutely no confidence in her writing. And she came to adulthood in the 1950s, and she was a typical um, sort of um, post-World War II housewife. I think by the time I came along in the 70s, she had finally stopped dressing to the nines every day and wearing heels around the house. And so um, her life really sort of fascinates me because she left school at age 13 to work and help support her um, siblings and, and, and Neither she or my great grandmother, I, I'm not quite sure, none of them actually graduated from high school. So it was very important to her that I went to college. And um, so she, she was very proud about that. And what's more, all my cousins did too. So she and my grandfather put, um, gosh, how many children, several children through school, um, through college. But um, you were talking about Amy home, going back home, and the foods that are associated with home. My grandmother is no longer alive. And I was at a um, diner a few years ago, and I ordered a slice of chocolate meringue pie. 
And just as soon as that pie hit my mouth, I started to cry because it tasted so much. It was like eating her pie. I can't believe that someone put my grandmother's pie in front of me and it was unexpected. And I hadn't at that time really grieved her death. I hadn't been able to cry. And so I'm sitting there in this little cafe, just weeping because I miss my grandmother so much. And there's all this food that she would make for us. You know, my sister and I talk about it all the time. We miss this, you know, we miss this, we miss that dish. And I'm constantly trying to recreate what she made. Um, I, I, I think everyone has a sense of understanding of what I'm talking about. But um, I wanted to talk about um, how our food, our experiences with food, almost immediately become storied into narrative. You know, there's the story of how you're making the food, there's serving the food, there's nourishing the people around you, or, you know, the food's awful, <laughs> there's scarcity. Um, but it's an element writers often neglect in their writing. And food memories are so deeply embodied and enmeshed that we reach for our senses and other sensual experiences to describe them. So like language, food is interpretable, it's symbolic, and it serves to make meaning as narrative. And this, um, I think all the panelists touched on today. When we describe what we eat, how we prepare and experience it, where we obtain it, how we share it, we reveal who we are and who our characters are. When we include food and food elements in our writing, um, our writing can grow more complex, vivid, granular, and it resonates with more emotion. Um, Food is memory, food is love. It's also violence, pain, grief, triumph, and joy. And food experience opens up text and writing. It develops and strengthens the elements of fiction and creative nonfiction and sparks innovation and prose. And um, I think it also contributes to, you know, artistry and voice um, and authority. Um, it also, how our characters and how we enter a text can, with food, can illuminate um, things about the human condition, like neurodivergence, disability, illness, race, religion, spirituality, culture, class. Um, and for me, uh, when in my writing, and when in writing that I appreciate and love, it's, it becomes embodied. There, there's a connection with the body and food. Um, you know, something like taste, hunger, longing, desire. And then there's, you know, rituals, celebration, trauma. You know, how um, Elaine mentioned food is comfort and it's, it's how you show affection or some people show affection. Definitely where I was growing up, food was love. Um, food elements can enhance brevity and compression and it, of course character just think of tea cake in Zora Neale Hurston's their eyes are watching God um, you could eat him up just like Jamie um, memory is something that interests me since at a relatively young age I experienced significant short-term and long-term memory loss due to catastrophic clotting and um, a history of trauma so I've learned over the years that what we think of as memory is much more complex and elastic. When we reach for memories, when we remember, we use language and narrative to reconstruct and represent our past. And when we recall and retell and we share them, we rewrite them. So an event, our stories change and thicken over time. Over time, over the telling, our narratives change, our memories change, and we change. So as writers, you've probably discovered that um, your most vivid and emotionally resonant writing occurs when you draw upon sensory experience and description, the kinesthetic and the physical. Um, an appreciable part of my identity is that as an amateur cook and baker, I'm at least someone who likes to cook as much as I like to read. Um, I shared recipes with my friends and family. 
It's uh, my earliest memories include spending time with my grandmothers and great grandmothers in kitchens as they told stories. And part of teaching me how to create food out of ingredients was the transmission of those stories. So how to cook, egg, you know, this thing involves a cousin or an aunt or when I was young. And so the stories are part of the recipe. And in Ruby, um, I publish recipes by the authors. And I, my favorite ones are the ones that has a storyline running through it. Um, now, I'll get to this in a minute, but you know, when you're looking for a recipe and you go to a blog and it's just, um, you know, you're just scrolling, 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 trying to get through all the, all the words just to get to the recipe. Um, this, I think what we do at Ruby is very different. <laughs> so, um, and it's difficult to pin down because I've read some amazing um, literature on websites like Food 52 and Savor. And so, you know, there's a strong tradition of food writing and um, I like that Ruby is at that intersection between literature and food writing. Um, but I wanna share you more about how I became aware of how food runs through gorgeous prose and how it can be used to enhance craft. Um, when my grandfather was dying, I was nearby at a uh, writing colony in Swanee, Tennessee called Rivendell. Um, I was waiting for that call to come from my grandmother that it was time to come say goodbye. Um, he had been in hospice for a while and um, he wasn't ready to leave. So I was restless and I ended up plucking this cookbook off of Rivendell shelves. Um, it was of the Alice Randall and her daughter, Caroline Randall Williams, Soul Food Love, which is a memoir cookbook. Um, I stood in that lonely kitchen and read about sugar tits how something sweet used to fool and pacify babies became the aching injustice of black women leaving their babies to fill their bellies on sugar water while the women went out to cook and nourish white people. And just standing there reading this powerful narrative, it, re it really changed the way I looked at writing and thought about writing. Um, when I was researching how to talk about food and food memories for Ruby, I discovered a journal called Food and Food Ways, Explorations in the History and Culture of Human Nourishment. And there was an article in volume 24 called Food, Memory, and Narrative, written by social scientist um, and the editor of the issue, uh, Meredith Ab um, Abarca and Joshua Colby. And I can get that citation to you all if you're interested. But this paragraph that they wrote, you know, resonated for me. Food memories had the ability to nourish and starve us physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, depending on the narratives by which these recollections are recreated. These narratives, therefore, are the sites where affirmations, ambiguities, and contradictions inform an individual's and groups' cultural subjectivities. The analyses of these forms of food narratives become the process of decoding the memories. Sensory, cognitive, habitual, performative that food creates. So every time a food memory is narrated in an oral, written, or performative form, the food recalled is reproduced as an embodied experience. In telling what we eat, we are showing who we are. Um, the late North Carolina writer and scholar, Randall Cannon, in his talk about character of the yam and the invisible man, at the 2018 Southern Foodway Symposium shared, for me, the hallmark of food in literature raised to the level of art is food interacting with character, food as character, food doing stuff, food being stuff, just as it happens with our flesh and blood, our mouths and our bellies and our memories. The best writers know that food is identity, food is alive and food is us. And since we're running out of time, I'm just going to stop there. But um, I, I hope that you know I've shared a little bit of just how I think you know you can incorporate food into your writing to just really successful and great effect. That was wonderful. Thank you all so very much. 
Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but what I would love to do if our panelists are game is invite our attendees to email us at brownbaglet at gmail.com with any questions that you have, and we will get those to our panelists and they can either write you directly, or I think what would be amazing is if we could get those on social media somehow, maybe um, little videos, or we can just make some graphics with the questions, because I feel like folks are going to have some amazing questions, and I know you guys are going to have amazing answers to those questions, so I would love to get those out um, to everyone. So if you have questions, Chloe, can you put our email in the chat? Send us um, those questions at brownbaglit at gmail.com and we are going to get those to the panelists. Thank you so, so very much. This was really an amazing panel. Um, thank you to Amy, April, Elaine, and Jolene. Um, if you found value in this or our other free events that Brown Baglet has offered, please consider making a small donation to cover our administrative costs at Buy Me a Coffee. And please, please purchase the books from um, our partner bookseller, Amy Bloom's Bookstore. They've set up a bookshelf um, for our fake AWP events, so you can find all the panelists' books there. And we hope to see you at future events and in future classes. And we will go ahead and... Stop this recording.